The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. And all this work we're doing, it's in an effort to lay the groundwork for protections for this river so that it doesn't disappear. Bugs leave a unique track, lizards, snakes. It is a great place to study tracks, to study animals. I was always interested in aquatic organisms. I grew up playing in creeks and ponds. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Watch a love story. This is just a little bit of heaven here. Alice loves this water. Joe loves this landscape. It's Ocotillo. It's very thorny, as is everything out here. Del loves this river valley. And it is. It's just absolutely gorgeous. It's what I love about this country so much. And Sarah, well, she loves science. We got a red breast sunfish. 118. They all share a deep and lasting passion to protect the Devil's River. It's a wild part of Texas that's vulnerable and fragile. There are now new threats to the Devil's River Valley that's led these folks to unite as advocates for the Devil's River. And this is their story. Aquatic biologist Sarah Robertson is out with her river studies team to do some saning. Let's go up and come down the side of this grass. One reason this place is so special is because there's a lot of unique species that occur here. So there are a lot of minnows that we don't find many other places in the U.S. This is the Devil's River minnow. So it used to occur in about five or six streams in West Texas and over the last few decades, we believe it's been extirpated from some of those areas. 46, so now it's down to about three, three streams in West Texas. The worry here is unregulated groundwater pumping. As Texas's population increases, the demand for water grows, which could threaten this pristine river. The threat of groundwater pumping, it's, it's a real worry out here. We're not exactly sure how much water could be pumped before we start seeing impacts to the springs and the species that are out here. So it's something that's definitely on the radar. We're putting a lot of research efforts in to try to better understand the system and how pumping like that would affect it. Alice Ballstrunk. There's so many butterflies out today. <laughs> is also worried about the health of the river. The headwaters of the Devil's River pretty much start right here. This is what we call Seven Springs. So these are the seven major springs of the headwaters. It's so beautiful and we just all love it. It's just so dear to our heart. Alice and many other folks worry that since there are no laws that say that you can't sell your water, the threat to pump and move that water for oil and gas or for big cities is real. If there are huge withdrawals of groundwater, that will definitely affect the river. And it belongs to all of us in Texas. What we're fighting for goes away. We only have one chance to keep it flowing. You know, if it gets eaten up by pumpers and it gets dried up, then there's no river left. Downstream from Alice's place is the Devil's River State Natural Area. Big canyon country. 
and Joe Joplin's the area manager. His job is to take care of the 37,000 acres of conserved land that sits along the Devil's River. I feel very much at peace out here. There's no noises, just you, the wind. You can't beat the solitude. It's good for the human soul. The Devil's River State Natural Area is a rugged location. It has bluffs, and steep canyons, and of course the Devil's River. You can come here and see what Texas was yesterday, before development before heavy population growth. It still has that wild feel where you can refill your senses. But there are threats encroaching on the scenic river valley. A wind farm has been built just miles from the Devil's River State Natural Area. And there are worries more wind farms are headed for this valley. Texas only has 3% public lands remaining. And places like the Devil's River State Natural Area are true iconic features within those public landscapes. If there ever is industrialization in this area, it needs to be very thoughtful and done with community involvement. They'll kind of move out. One neighbor who lives across the river couldn't agree more. <laughs> Del Dickinson and his family have ranched in the Devil's River Valley since the late 1800s. It's about two and a half miles straight that way to the river. I don't advise walking it is rougher than a corn cob. Dell spent his entire life here and has always loved his evenings by the fire. Mesquite, good old burning mesquite. To me, sitting in front of a fire just takes all the, the bad stuff out and there's nothing left but good. But now there's something else sparkling in the distance. Over the years, I've been able to look out over the horizon and see nothing but serenity. And now I look up and see something on the horizon that I just consider a flat abomination. And just past sunset is when the problem truly presents itself. This is one of the most wondrous, beautiful times of the day. It's called twilight going into full dark and now I look out there and I see these, pardon my language, god-awful lights out there. You can't get away from them. They're there forever. Dell worries that Texas will lose one of its truly iconic landscapes if wind farms were to expand here. We see this panorama in front of us. Imagine how it's going to be if they're successful in further encroachment. We'll be able to go horizon to horizon and see them everywhere. And I, again, I have to say, I don't think this is what the citizens of Texas that own this river bargain for, ask for, or deserve. From preservation-minded landowners like Dell. Ready? To Sarah and her saning for science. Sampling's been going good. We've been getting a lot of species. Texas Shiner, 53. So this is the Rio Grande darter. It's only found in the Rio Grande Basin in Texas, and it's listed as state threatened. There's common ground here. This iconic Texas wonder is worth protecting. This is a really special river. It's really unique. It's one of the last wild and scenic places in Texas. Rio Grande darter, 42. And all this work we're doing, building partnerships, doing research, it's in an effort to lay the groundwork for protections for this river so that it doesn't disappear. People often comment when they leave the Devil's River that they left more than they came with, meaning they got a refill of their spirit. Maybe it's the ruggedness of the steep canyons. But when you leave here, you have a sense that, man, I really saw something that was Texas. It feels wild, it feels untouched. And that's the goal, to keep it that way. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish Restoration Program. The dunes change visibly. They are constantly moving, changing shape. It is the only section of this type of dune field in all of Texas. 
is serene. A lot of people come here over and over for the peace and quiet that you get out here. You get away from the tracks and away from the people and it almost feels like you're the only one that's ever been here. It's a little bit surreal to be out here in the middle of the dunes that are unlike anything anywhere else in Texas or for most of the country for that matter. My name is Michael Smith. I'm a superintendent and park police officer for Monahan Sand Hill State Park. We are in far west Texas, actually not very far from Midland, Odessa and the corner of New Mexico in the Permian Basin. This sand literally is an immigrant from northern New Mexico and Colorado. The theory goes that it was ground very small and round under the last ice age and then settled in the Permian Basin. The wind can't blow it back out or doesn't often blow it out, but it does keep swirling it around down in the bowl. There's plants and animals that exist here that don't exist anywhere in Texas. It is a place to be able to find um, dune sagebrush lizards. The sand itself is very different than any sand, both physically and geologically. We have about an 800 acre area on the park set aside specifically for equine use. There's three campsites and a day use area available. They should bring plenty of water and be careful of their horses, but we would encourage people to come and ride and, and explore this unique area. Tents, RVs, any camping of any sort is strongly encouraged. It's very quiet, very peaceful. The flip side of serene is duning or sledding. We rent and sell discs and toboggans to slide down the dunes on. Young kids love this park. And children of all ages, they love to play in the sand. It does not matter to them that there's no beach, that there's no water. It's fun. The snowboard was really hard to do. Pretty exciting times with it. But my favorite thing is the disc or just rolling down. The water surfing we cannot provide, but we have all the sand surfing one could ever want. Most folks don't even realize when they drive from the headquarters or the front of the park to the sand dunes that they come here to see, they're driving through a portion of one of the largest oak forests in the world. It's about 50,000 acres altogether and just a little wee bit shorter than most of them. At maturity, about three or four feet. The shin oak provides habitat for most of the animals that live here, provides a place for the smaller ones to hide, provides foods for both large and small. We have a lot of flowers here. Some of the same ones that you would see in the hill country and then some that are unique to a, a drier climate. It is a great place to study tracks, to study animals. When the wind comes, it can wipe all the tracks away. Uh, and so the next day you can see what passed in the night, check out the tracks. Uh, Bugs leave a unique track, lizards, um, snakes. I also like the history of this place. It has been barrier and refuge since prehistoric man. After them, the Hamano Indians, and after them, the Apaches and Comanches would find refuge in these dunes, a seemingly impassable, um, unfriendly place that because of the seeps, the naturally occurring water features here, actually provided everything a person needed to live. If not for the railroad, there might not have ever been the town of Monahans. Monahans is named after John Monahan, who dug a well for the TMP Railroad, and it became Monahans Well, and then the town of Monahans. It became a water stop for steam engines. It was a rugged area far from any development back when the railroad came through. And then eventually, Bankhead Highway Route 1, the first all weather coast to coast highway, came through here and right next to Bankhead Highway, Interstate 20 was created. And so it's still an area that draws people from very, very far away. Where we're standing is a mile and a half off the highway. So what most people come to see, you don't see from the highway. You have to get off the road and take some time. 
I feel like preserving this particular very, very unique ecosystem to Texas is extremely important. There is a lot to see here. I have been pleasantly surprised virtually every day since living here. Some of the most beautiful sunsets and sunrises I've ever seen have been right here. They just open up the entire sky is full of color. It's, it's stunningly beautiful. There's nothing in Texas that you can compare this to. You just gotta come out and check it out yourself. My name is Dihar Let's Carrillo, and my title is the geneticist for the Inland Fisheries Division of Texas Parks and Wildlife. I've worked as the geneticist since 2004. I've been here for 11 years working with TPWD, and Dihar was well established in many of the genetic monitoring programs we do. I was always interested in aquatic organisms and fish. I grew up playing in creeks and ponds. I started looking for an aquatics program. I found one, and then when I got there, I decided that I wanted to kind of branch off and do something different. And so that's how I got into genetics. That and Jurassic Park. <laughs> We've built some pretty much from the ground up. My favorite example probably is with our Guadalupe Bass Initiative. We do restoration work, for instance, with the state fish, the Guadalupe Bass. Dihar has been helping uh, direct and, and run those programs, and it's expanding all the time. There are management people collecting fish out in the wild, then the hatcheries producing fish, and so we're trying to stock fish to maintain and restore native population. Dihar is not only a national expert, but a world expert in black bass identification. His work is so critical to uh, expanding our knowledge about black bass and understanding the genetic differences between different systems. It's unique to Parks and Wildlife that we're able to pursue a pure science concept that benefits the agency and benefits science in general. Every day I know that I'm going to get to answer a question that's either meaningful to me or meaningful to somebody else. This is the last vestige of a herd of three and a half to four million bison that once lived here for thousands of years. It is a part of Texas history that must not be lost. My name is Wyman Menzer and I'm a professional photographer. You know, every time I drive into this country, it, I'm reminded of the, some of the words from the old Buffalo Hunters and Pioneers journals about the, uh, the wildlife that existed here, the bison especially. Literally millions of them. I actually saw the old film that was uh, released in 1916. It was an opportunity to see the way that the, the Native Americans hunted. It was just a glimpse into the past that we will never see again. These are Southern Plains bison that for thousands of years have roamed this area. My name is Donald Beard. I'm the park superintendent here at Caprock Canyon State Park. It's almost 14,000 acres of some of the most rugged, beautiful canyon lands in the state of Texas. The light just does amazing things in here. We're the home of the official state of Texas bison herd. These bison have unique genetic markers not found in any other bison in the world. 
They are an important, crucially, vitally important part of the conservation of the species of bison. The great kill occurred really in 1877 when they said like over a million bison were killed in Texas. Each buffalo hunter killing uh, hundreds of buffalo in a matter of days. It was here on the J.A. Ranch in the late 1870s when, when Charles Goodnight and his wife Mary established the, the buffalo herd that is today is on Caprock Canyon State Park. She saw the slaughter occurring, felt for the bison, saw the little calves, and just decided, you know, I'm gonna save some of them. Jay Wright Moore, when he talked about coming up in this region and, the, and, and just seeing a herd of buffalo, you know, f uh, 10 miles deep and 110 miles wide. And it's just, it just, it just amazes me to think that this country could, could support that many, that many creatures. We're in the process of performing our annual gathering and working of the Texas State Bison Herd. What we do is we administer vaccines to safeguard against various diseases. Right, she needs blood work. We perform pregnancy checks on the females, do an overall health check of all the animals. Just make sure everybody's good and healthy and just, just general health check, make sure it's all good. These are just amazing creatures. And when you're down on the ground with them and you're up close with them, you really get a sense of how massive they are. You have to kind of paint yourself every now and then so you don't take it for granted. There's a buffalo down there. So our goal is to expand their territory here in the park from about 300 acres into approximately 1,000 acres of native grass restored prairie land. What we have done is we've allowed the animals to come into their new pasture. We are restoring an indigenous wildlife to its native habitat. The genetic pool of Southern Plains bison will roam the old trails of the millions before them. And I'm very thankful for that. This is its, its, its historic home, is we're fulfilling Marianne Goodnight's vision. With the dust, with the light, even though I'm viewing a herd of 75 or 80 through a lens, I'm thinking of 10,000. Because of the long-term view of people like Charles Goodnight and Mary Ann Goodnight, the J.A. Ranch, Texas Parks and Wildlife, we still have these wonderful beasts among us. That one, that one, this is so exciting just to see this just to picture what it was like long, long ago. We have tried to look at every aspect possible as far as the safety of both the animals and the visitors. When you come in the park, you are in the habitat with the bison. They are wild animals. They can run 35 miles an hour faster than a horse. We have designed this fence it's as strong as it can be and still maintain that free-ranging appearance where they're not behind a, an exhibit. I think our biggest key is going to be visitor education. We have to let these people know that when they come in here, these are wild animals, that they need to keep their distance and keep safe. Eventually, we hope to have the herd roaming just the entire park itself. These magnificent animals, the Texas State Bison Herd, the last remnants of the great Southern Plain Bison, these animals belong to the state of Texas. They're your animals. It's a great opportunity to come view the last of their kind as we try to do our best to expand their range and grow the herd.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.